I like the hair color. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. <laughs> Welcome to the I'll fine print. I'll say that live. I like your hair color. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Caleb Teske, and today, an interview I've been trying to get for I don't even know how long. It's Jen Daniels from Marisem Farms. Jen, thank you for being here. Thank you. That's very, <laughs> that's too kind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we finally made this work. Um, before we do anything serious, will you give us a five-minute life story? And please, yeah. if you need more time, go for it. Because I believe I quoted you as saying, I have a wild backstory. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, if I, so if I'm, I just turned 50, September 21st. So if I do one minute for each decade, I can keep it. Um, well, I just, I think, you know, I, I recently was thinking, I don't know, maybe it's midlife. I'm not sure. Like if I died tomorrow, you know, what would I, what, how would I feel? Um, and I think a lot of my life has been about um, creativity and uh, giving back. Oh, that, that's, that's uh, something I have that over there. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I was a dancer for most of my life. I was a ballet dancer, really serious, um, taught me discipline, um, balance, which is really, really helpful. Cause when I, I know I'm off balance, I go back to movement. Um, and all of these things really connect to running a business, which is, I think, most of entrepreneurship is about getting knocked off balance and getting the fuck back on to balance. So being a dancer has been amazing. I still dance today. I teach on the side, uh, little kids earn a little extra money because again, running a business is, you know, <laughs> cash flow is really difficult sometimes, a lot of times. Um, so anyway, I was a dancer forever. I was at a ballet company, um, grew up in Pennsylvania, um, but always sort of had a curious nature and, um, you know, did some traditional schooling, non-traditional schooling, um, study anthropology, but then had the privilege to go out west and um, spend some time with Novi um, Hopi and Navajo kids, um, being one of the only white folks in the room. And I think that's pivotal for if you're white and growing up in the United States to be around folks who don't look like you, because most of the time, a lot of the times in the U.S., you are privileged to be, you know, amongst other white folks. Yeah, and especially in Vermont. <laughs> particularly in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and it just at a young age it taught me like what it feels like to be other. Um, and also when to stop talking, you know, like when to be quiet and when to realize I was sitting next to, I was in a circle and it was, it was a leadership training program for kids from the res. And I was sitting next to a really successful Hopi lawyer. And the group was asked a question and I was thinking about saying something. And then I realized like, they don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from this very successful Hopi lawyer um and uh Navajo lawyer sorry and uh, you know it was very grounding um and very humbling and so th that I've taken throughout my life so I worked in New Mexico for a while on and off and then had an opportunity to go to Russia I had already studied ballet in St. Petersburg oh um, yeah that was fun uh alongside cool former Kirov teachers, dancers, um, wow. pretty grueling training. Um, Holy cool. shit. Yeah, it was cool. Um, and then, you know, kind of, so I have a background, my background is Lithuanian, uh, Eastern European Ashkenazi Jew. So I was kind of connected to that region. Um, my peoples ran from Russia, from the Russian pogroms. So, um, I still kind of felt an affinity to the to the country. Um, Is that maybe, how your family ended up in the states? Yeah, in, in yeah, in early 1900s. Yes, wow. my grandfather immigrated, uh, and his older brother dressed up like a girl to escape the Russian to the army, and you know ran from pogroms wow. uh, uh, through Ellis Island. I, and, I don't think uh, they take too kindly to like people taking off, huh? Like from the army, huh? Or trying to dodge the draft or something. Yeah, exactly. Wow. But pogroms were um, no small matter. Holy shit. Um, so, yeah, and that's uh, uh, part of our life story. And um, my father was first generation. 
Um, but uh, so it still felt like a connection, I think, to Russia. I studied, learned Russian um, and speak Russian is pretty rusty right now, but ended up um, going back there with my now husband, um, lived there for six years. Um, and we were working in uh, despite the fact that my kids think we have three kids, um, we're spies, which we aren't. But then, of course, if I were a spy, I'd probably say I wasn't, right? Like, yeah, that's what a spy <laughs> would say. Exactly. Cover. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so we worked um, with, uh, I work with what's called small numbered populations. Um, a lot of similar problems to what has plagued um, Navajo, Hopi, Native American, Indigenous communities here with less violence. Um, the Soviet regime was not kind. Um, Russia is a fairly, I mean, it's 11 time zones and it's a pretty difficult country. Um, right now, oops, it pains me to see what's happening. Um, so anyway, we lived there for six years. Um, my husband partner did in, uh, environmental work and we were all over the place. So uh, Moscow, Siberia, Lake Baikal, deepest lake in the world, the Russian Far East, Vladivostok. Um, so much so that we weren't paying taxes in the States because we were there for six years. Uh, came back here. Um, I uh, was a trained facilitator, which I was running dialogues. Um, so like cross-cultural communication, leadership stuff, and did a lot of that then in the States. So ran dialogues in what would have been called race relations, um, but so sort of improving community dialogue like and, and like relationship building. Um, well, if you also and, speak Russian, you probably could translate a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the States, it was really with, um, you know, local communities. So like in New Haven, Connecticut with black, white churches uh, who wanted to, um, you know, work together, but needed a common language. And what I just did was held the space and basically ensured that everyone, you know, had sort of equal opportunity to, to speak and held kind of like what would be a multi-partial viewpoint, which again, like all these skills are building up to how you run a business. Um, and then did a massive about pay about uh, face and um, studied landscape architecture, like completely. It's like, all right, I'm going to do something different i guess that is also a privilege just got, of this just got tired of ballet or something yeah yeah and uh <laughs> but the reason why i was really attracted to landscape architecture was it's about the design of humans in their spaces and i was really interested in like how spaces impact uh your daily life or how they affect conflict you know like when even in your own home you know like when you're comfortable in your space it's like things are in the right way and you can be productive and you can be creative but when they're not you can't and mm -hmm. this can impact you on like you know a 24 by 24 foot square to thousands of acres um so yeah, I, think I, I think i drive my girlfriend nuts because i'm constantly leaving shit where it's not supposed to be I, I, yes you are <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I am i know i'm trying not yeah. to but tell her to call me i completely she's way more organized than i am and it's hard for me <laughs> yeah exactly well but see you have your own flow and she has hers and right yeah she's a yeah. good sport let's just say that yeah. yeah right on well props to her um yeah i've been married for like almost how are we long 23 years going wow. in and together for like 30 i know so i know right <laughs> and we started a business together which is wow. you know, i know i know in fact when we were first going when we first started the business and we were thinking you know we were for a minute um looking at you know investors which oh god keep me far away from venture capital i mean if you're interested out there people yes come my way but it's a real challenging place to be. But anyway, um, somebody said, oh, I don't know about investing in a husband and wife team. And then we looked at each other we're like, well, actually, it's working for us. And we have this, you know, very quiet, innate sense of trust. I know that, um, and particularly in this cannabis industry, you know, I know that I can trust him. I know that. That's you know, a big thing. <laughs> yeah. 
It's huge. It's huge. So, um, so after landscape architecture, did projects um, in Wyoming. Uh, my kids were actually all born in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which my husband was in the Forest Service, so that's how we ended up there. Oh no, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I would never have expected to land there, um, but it's a really incredibly beautiful part of our country. Um, did a very cool project for the Rockefellers, actually. Um, they were giving 1,100 Ooh. acres. I know, they were giving you, 1,100 excuse acres. Excuse me. No, no, no. It was, <laughs> they were giving it to the park, so it became a part of the Grand Teton National Park. And um, yeah, so now you can so go. They owned, they owned some of that land. Oh my God, did they ever, did they ever? Yeah, hmm. talk about, well, um, well but anyway. Yeah, so, I've, read, I've read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you have, yeah. So, um, and then, wow. uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and then I ended up in uh, uh, DC from Wyoming. We went back to the East Coast. Um, that's, a, that's a bit of a change of pace there. Huge, yeah. I mean, we're East Coasters to begin with, but um, yeah, it was a it was a big change. Um, but I was became the landscape architect for the Smithsonian National Zoo, and that was another weird one. Is like that? what? Um, it's an in. Do you know Central Park? Right, Olmsted, who designed sure. Central Park in in New York City. So he designed the zoo. It's a uh, urban like green lung in the middle of now now it's in the middle of dc it wasn't before um and yeah another fascinating nine years of sometimes fantastic privilege to be designing spaces that millions of people were going through other days like i alluded to when we were talking prior like the bureaucratic nightmare that is our <laughs> government <laughs> wanting to be really, really creative um, and just kind of getting hit with mediocrity is really the way to go. And I, I don't like mediocrity. So, and then, uh, then we were like, okay, we're done with federal, my husband as well. And we, we, we decided to leave it all and, um, because well for a lot of reasons that I can or can't get into but um it was ready we were ready to go and um we decided to start a business and Rick had a lot of long connections to the cannabis world you know out in Berkeley deadhead um and oh. yeah not me I'm not I'm not <laughs> I respect them I love the deadhead so you're a ballet dancer and your husband is a deadhead yeah Awesome. <laughs> I mean, if you want to use one word to describe it, sure. <laughs> I don't mean to generalize. But no, yeah. No, no, no. Okay. yeah, yeah. I think he's he's a recovering deadhead. Well, because you know, <laughs> one, there's so much more music out there. Thank God. Um, you know, you actually, have to go to rehab for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna get shit for this, but. <laughs> um there's just so much music i love music I i'll, love I'll music. have him on after and he can talk I know to you about should. you yeah <laughs> <laughs> i will listen to that uh anyway so and then for the past let's see we got here summer of 2018 thank why, god why vermont jen yeah good question so um a i've i've had a sort of um kind of what vermont has been woven woven through a lot of my history um deep respect for this landscape we're both lands people um rick in the forest service um and and uh studied forestry and me and lands landscape um it was either california or vermont in terms of just specifically looking at the cannabis industry california was already kind of whacked with its rules and regs and not going in their good direction plus it was a huge move where i we sort of feel our comfort on the east coast and Vermont made sense. I actually had studied at the School of International Training that is actually in Brattleboro when I was in my like conflict resolution transformation days, um, studied at Norwich University, um, the Institute, the Language Institute. So it, it was a fairly comfortable place. I still miss urban, um, but you know, it's, it, it, it's been, really approachable it's a really like generally it's pretty you can you can touch government really easily you can meet people really easily i think there's pros and cons to that of course <laughs> right <laughs> like everybody knows you so everybody knows you um so you know it's 
I, being a facilitator, understanding how to navigate systems from like I was saying Soviet systems to bureaucratic systems um, has softened the kind of convoluted nature of cannabis. Um, but yeah, it's a fairly gentle place to live, especially during the pandemic. I was really grateful. We have three kids um, that we could sure. be here and, and not in an urban. So setting. what were you guys, uh, did they shut the schools down, I assume, and you guys just were at home with three yeah. kids and yeah. Yep. Yeah. And luckily, I mean, I, I feel for those who had children who were like going crazy. Our, our, my, I have a 16 year old and two 14 year olds and okay. we've raised them to be really, really independent. They all cook for themselves. They're, you know, like, yeah, I didn't, I yeah, mean, I was always I wish, working with parents. I wish school would have shut down for a fucking year when I was in there. <laughs> I would have loved it. It would have been my favorite thing that ever happened. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, they're, you know, they're lucky to be in a loving family and we know that. And so we did our best and, um, you know, certainly everybody, all kids have suffered through the like sort of, sort of hiccup in education. Um, but they'll, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. I question our education system anyway. So I don't think a year I, off is really that damaging. Yeah, you're right to do so. And well, and we all know that's it's just it's just one foundation, you know, I, I mean, I, you need to get out there and learn. And I've learned more from doing this than I ever learned in college. Yeah, but yeah, easily, easily. So, it's just a yeah. different kind of knowledge for sure. And yeah, I think it's more it's more applicable. Like, you know, I, I don't mind a little book smarts, but I'm much, much more of like a street smarts kind of guy. Yeah. I pr yeah. prefer to learn that kind of shit. 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah. It, so, so I wanted to ask you here because you built this up to moving to Vermont, and my first note in my phone is said something about the Lamoille County area, and that the oh, yeah. soil, the soils are just amazing here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So you did Ten acres of hemp or something, yep. and uh, yeah, yep, yep. We landed in Lamoille, um, and yeah, we had a wonderful first year. Um, we did about ten acres, had a small staff, um, used all our basically retirement savings. We did not come. We neither one of us come from money. Um, this was massive risk. I would say some of our friends are like, "What the hell?" Right? Like, shouldn't one of you? you know, had a job. Um, so and you got some pushback from your friends, huh? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, didn't you have really secure jobs? Uh, some family members with the federal government, you know, why would you do that? Um, for sure. And I mean, I can see it from that side. Um, that was a legit question also... to ask as a family member, probably. Yeah, no, completely loving and reasonable. Um, but they also didn't go to work every day in an, in an institution that was a little, dare I say, like soul crushing sometimes. And if not, you know, worse, um, I'll let Rick share his stories. I won't speak for him, but um, you know, it was, it, it wasn't fulfilling. Um, and that's, a, that's being kind, <laughs> that's being kind. No, that's I mean, there's important more... though. Like when you have to, it's kind of like you said, like about uh, arranging your space in your house, like shit that you have to do every day, you know, like eventually like little tiny things will like eat away at you. And, and yeah, you yeah. know, if you have to do that for a career, you know, it, it will yeah. probably just grind at your brain every day. Yeah. And the Smithsonian, you know, is it's the largest museum complex in the world. And yeah. so there is an allure uh, a sexiness to working for something like that but there's there's I was remember reading something and like when I was trying to get out of it that like you know don't stay somewhere because of what you think it is and what you think it's going to give you and what it looks like at a cocktail party or on paper it's just you know it's it's in the end of the day I did great work I have projects that I can be proud of that have won awards but it was it wasn't my soul was and was not like it wasn't there for me. It really wasn't. So So you started growing hemp. Yeah, you know, why not? <laughs> is that where your soul is? Have, have you have you done any other kind of like gardening or any any kind of stuff before that? Well, so I mean, what I would look at is how do you build a business, right? Sure. Like 
growing. So what I'm really thankful for is that we were able to acquire our own genetics, Vermont bred genetics, and then met some incredible people who were the experts. I know, like as a business owner, I know, I think most of them, one of the most important things is knowing what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I've never pretended to be an expert in horticulture. Um, have I learned along the now going into our fifth year? Hell yeah. I've built drying. I've planted every year, hand planted, by the way, <laughs> um, harvested. But I mean, I have deep, deep respect for those that have spent decades um, and long, well, decades in growing, both indoor and outdoor. Now, everything we do is outdoor. Mm -hmm. So I think more focused on farming and horticulture. So our first couple of years, we had some phenomenal horticulturists with working along. I, I worked alongside of them. Um, and yeah, it was amazing. Our first year was incredible um, and had a beautiful harvest, um, mainly because of the two folks that were working with us. Um, and I guess I guess I can. Yeah, I mean, it's, pu it's public knowledge, like Chris Modica, um, who's now working for the CCB. She's sure off the rails incredible um and dennis bianco um who's still kind of in the in, in the world um to just i mean i they were like family um and we just had an incredible incredible first year um but it was also like yeah i mean i i just can't say enough um you said so. that was 2018 that was 2019 oh 19 was this yeah, after we got the here was this after the price crunch? Um, it was probably we were in it, and you so were in it. so, we were, so I was we're curious. I was going to ask you sort of how you made out through that process. Yeah. Oh God. Volatility. Yeah. I mean, the it. I guess still the fact that we're still here is. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I attribute to having a lot of professional lives. You know, like picking out all the things that have done served me well to keep going, but I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Some mornings I wake up and I'm like, Oh God, kill me now. Like, this is just, it's, it's so again, like it's killing me. <laughs> um, cash flow has been like, you know, just completely volatile. But um, I think what I rest on is that is the quality of the product. You know, I mean, I, I, nothing gets me better when people come to me and say, you know, I found your product. It helped me quit smoking or yeah, I found yeah. will your you tell us, will you tell us about your product? Cause I think we yeah. skipped that part. No, of course. Of course. Um, so, um, because we started at the soil and because we started with genetics, terroir was really important. Like the plant was really important. Um, and so what we developed, what I, we developed mainly almost looking at what was the sort of easiest product to create, um, with the least amount of cash. Um, so we developed these pre-rolls and each one of them, they're all like color coded. Cause of course I have them here. Cause you know, oh, I'm nice. Like, Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Supposed to, Get them in right? there, like, hold, hold it right up to the camera. Okay. Hold, I, I hold can't it up. Say, with, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I have my camera off cause I said I don't stare at myself. <laughs> but anyway. Um, and I look at you. Um, so each one of those represents a variety. They tell a story, you know, the terpene cannabinoid profile and they're, you know, really satisfying, but I don't say that I base that on customer satisfaction. Um, and really it's all about building relationships. I with read some of your reviews, Jen. Yeah. They're not so bad. They're not. They're so not. Bad. Your <laughs> they're customers so love you. And I got to tell you, uh, you gave me a pack of your hemp smokes Yeah, and I've tried some, you got some of those there too. I do. Of course they do. Of course. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You okay, gave me a good. pack of those. And I got to tell you, I've tried a couple packs of different hemp smokes before that I fucking hated. I did not like them at all. And I can't say that about yours. I actually really enjoyed them. Uh, I smoked them all. I, I don't know if they helped me quit smoking, but it certainly gave me something else to think about. Um, right. I would keep them right next to my pack of cigarettes. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was a nice option. Um, I still am a fiend for nicotine and I'm trying to work on that, but yeah. um, 
they, they really they got a beautiful flavor and um you know i i have to say as as far as the limited amount of hemp smokes that i've tried um those are probably some of the best that's awesome. I really appreciate that. I mean, that's what the toughest part of this business is really getting products in people's hands. I, you know, when you're a very I'm a really, really small company, I, you know, I, I, I could I travel around as much as I can. I was in D.C. trying to get a drum up an account that I'm working on. And all of that takes, as anyone can imagine, you know, just constant, you know, persistence. Um, and I appreciate it. I really, really do. And that's what kind of keeps me going, you know, like being able to, through all that work of planting and harvesting. And now we work with farm partners. Um, there still are genetics. I'm still planting. Um, but we have, like I said, you know, an expert that's there every day. So, um, you know, we got into the, from where'd Lamoille. You, where'd you like, find that expert? Um, well, so after Lamoille and, um, we, we, we weren't able to keep that farm because the contract fell through, but luckily, luckily, um, we were able to start these smokes, um, which was just, you know, just creative connections and luck, but we had to lay off our two em beloved employees, which I think yeah. honestly, uh, above my mom died when I was 24, quite young, um, above from apart from that, losing those two employees. And then a, we had two others was so devastating because I, I mean, we truly loved them and it was really tough. And since then we've mended, we're now sort of back loving each other, but it was, it was rough. It was, it was really tough. It's what happens when you just don't have enough capital, right? Like to weather, I mean, this was a a big contract that we thought like, okay, we, you know, we did the opposite of what a lot of folks may have done, which was like, just grow without knowing where it was going to go. And the contract fell through. Um, so, you know, but we made it through and we started farming in the Northeast kingdom um, with a farmer up there. That's my neck of the woods. I know off Creek road in Irisburg. So that was pretty awesome for two years. Nice. But we anyway, so that was that was really, really great. That's where I sort of, you know, fell in love with that incredible landscape up there. And just there's sort of like this magnetism up there that is if you haven't been if you haven't had the privilege to spend time in the Northeast Kingdom, you really are missing Vermont. You really yeah. just don't. You're not. That's where magic is like it just. It's just I can't I don't know it's, it's it doesn't have words <laughs> magic and magic and heroin right? no. <laughs> there's always another side to you know that's yeah that's the flip side of the magic <laughs> I'm not I mean you know I'm not I'm not that nice but yeah. you know Jen I want to stop and, and back up a little because you mentioned this thing about not having the capital and I believe when we spoke on the phone the first time access to capital was was something that you uh, made a big point of yeah um what that that, that it's hard <laughs> like, i don't know i'll go back in the notes if i have to but i, I didn't yeah. even have a question but i know that's something that you commented on um I, it's a it's a real i mean you know we've all seen it I, well in every industry there's like you know, only certain people get keys to unlock the door to, uh, that behind which there's a mountain of cash. Um, and if you are, you know, uh, a, we all know this, like a well-groomed white young guy that fits into the venture capital world and knows how to speak that language, it's a lot easier. Now, that's changing slowly. If you look across the industry, um, it's now slowly being made up. And, and, you know, business in general, like we're, we're pushing back more women, more folks of color, you know, I mean, just like enough. Um, look, you have to have a good business model. You have to, you, you have to show up smart. It's not just going to get handed to you. Um, but you know, privilege, like I have privilege, right? I'm white. I'm well educated. I know this, I know this. Right. And so white, white I, women are killing it right now. Yeah, are they? <laughs> are they? Uh, good on them, I guess. I mean, I'm, 
No, we're we're here. We're we're st we still have products. Um, I don't. I wouldn't use the word killing it for me. Um, that's way too. I Maybe mean, I should say this is the time where, like, like I see, like, especially in politics, I'm seeing a lot of uh, women getting involved in politics, especially in yeah. Vermont, which yeah. is cool. Like, yeah. I, like, yo, yeah. it's time to open it up. Like, yeah. let's give everyone a rip at it. Hundred percent. And see if it's the system failing or just the fact that it's not diverse. Yes, I I think it's the that I think it's the that is well, yes the system is failing us for sure I mean all of us right that's an equal opportunity um, and yes it's not diverse and I think it's I mean I think life's more interesting than when different folks come together I mean I agree. you know you, it, like conversations are more um, like like um, what's the word like controversial in a good way yeah. right. If you're constantly talking to somebody that's just nodding their head and agreeing with everything you're saying, are you learning or are you just listening to yourself mm. be right? I get um, tired of talking to white people, Jen. I've lived here most of my whole life, and I wish that there was a more diverse crowd to talk to. Right. It's, it's, right. Just a, well, it's a blizzard of white folks. <laughs> yeah. And and let's be frank. We're by, I mean, I'm white identifying. I assume you are. It's, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think yeah. that um, one of the reasons, so I've, I've been involved in the like social racial equity space for decades. Since oh, I, yeah. I was going to ask you about the social equity thing. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, why? Why? I mean, it's really as simple as human dignity right? Like what side of justice do you want to be on? Um, if you can look around our country and notice where folks don't feel like they're living with liberation, you know, are looked at or um, decided about because of their color of their skin, it's just simply not right. And how can I teach my children and raise my kids in a country like that? It's really very simple in, in my mind. So the complicated part is how you how you are part of the change. And so in Vermont, it is complicated. It is, I know this isn't the right word because I know the meaning behind this word, but there, it does sometimes feel a little segregated. Obviously not the way the stark segregation, you know, where, where sure. there were water fountains, of course. But, you know, the comfortability of conversation, the ability to build coalition together, right? Um, it's coming. It's coming. I, and there, I'm seeing the way dialogues are happening. I have been, for the past two years, part of the Social Equity Caucus of Vermont, which is formed oh, cool. by the legislature. It's actually one of the only caucuses in the country, or so we, or what I've been told by another representative who was part of the formation, um, that allows community members in. So there's legislators, different reps, and nonprofits, and community members, which is saying a lot for Vermont. Can we name any of those legislators? Oh, uh, Coach Christy, um, Representative Elizabeth Burroughs. There's tons of Becca Ballant would come in, and um, Keisha Rahm was was one of the founding members. Saudi Lamont, who's now a rep, was part of the form formation. Um, Al Hol uh, Holston, I'm I'm no is that that's okay. I'm not going to hold yeah. your feet anyway, to the fire. I was no, wondering but if there, you just there, had a few examples. Yeah. Yeah. No, so folks, reps from Winooski, Burlington, Emma Mulvaney, Stanek, but all over the state, and it's really fascinating because basically for the past two years, it's just this. It and then there's folks represented from the NAACP in different areas um, of Vermont. Kaya Morris is there. Oh, and, uh, I'd love to talk to Kaya. Yeah, she's uh, incredible. Every time she speaks, I'm like fascinated. Um, such remember, a wonderful yeah. Patient. I remember following that story about uh, about her a few years back. Dude, yeah. that's kind of disturbing. Yeah, disturbing. Um, yeah the head of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. So, you know, and different reverends, Reverend Arnold Thomas. Oh, um, cool. Incredible. Um, I, I'm blanking. Lots of other That's folks. That's okay. That was pretty good, Jen, off the yeah. top. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um yeah, and and of course Susanna Davis, who was appointed by the governor to head up the racial equity um mm. office, um, mm. who also you know is involved in you know making sure our cannabis program is 
is kind of staying true to what is trying to be. I, I want to interrupt you a little, and I'm sorry yeah, to course. do that, but we no, got to no, 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 stop at one. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to ask you a little bit about your maybe your cultivation techniques and what you guys are doing on the farm and if you're growing anything other than cannabis. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk a little more about that. Yeah. Um, uh, well, because we collab, like we farm with partners, or, it really. Have, sorry, I don't. I'm not sure right. if I'm supposed to call oh, it's it. All can it is cannabis. Right. <laughs> I just I don't know the words. Oh no! Yes, you do. Yeah, you yes. do. Like, you're right. <laughs> um, I mean, it's all cannabis. So because we have farm partners, we always end up bringing genetics, and we farm using clones. So we use a young plant nursery that's always housed the genetics. And then we, you know, use clones. It's a reliable way of planting when you don't have the nursery and when you don't have that space. Um, I know there's pros and cons. And, and you know, you'll get feel like seeds are better, clones are better. Like, yes, all of that. We've been successful with clones every year. Um, this next year, I'm not sure where we're going to partner. Um, I'm actually looking for a farm partner. So if there's folks out there who okay. are interested, um, you know, we've met a lot of awesome farmers up in, in the NEK. Um, Have you talked you, to John Rogers? <laughs> he's got his own product. So okay. usually, usually folks. Well, if you're looking uh, for partners, uh, in what sense? You're looking for extra land farm. or? Yeah, a farm partner, like someone who wants it, you know, usually lives on the land who has, you know, the space to like, we, you know, minimum two acres um, and uh, yeah, wants to be a part of it. We're, we usually are, bring the labor um, and then okay. you know, we, so there's you're just looking for space. Yeah. Like, yeah. And a, and a farmer, I mean, our approach to like what does a farm partner mean for us was a always putting the farmer first, um, making sure that farmer is well taken care of. And yeah. we have, um, we have, and even when we haven't, we, you know, put that farmer first. Um, a lot of that stems from the fact that Rick Fox, my partner, comes from the U.S. Department of Agriculture world, has been involved in the farm bill, writing policy. He still is now advocating oh, for small and medium-sized farms. His um, push on, it, he's had less time to do Vermont work, although he has, but um, is really like making sure small and medium-sized farms really get a good show. So um, I definitely got to talk to Rick. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be a very, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you should, you should. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's our cultivation style. I've always wanted to interplant and, and have other botanicals because, you know, for pest reasons. Um, and in the last farm, there was a lot of or um, chamomile in and around and already, you know, we always um, overplant with red clover and, you know, it really depends on what the farmer wants. And um, I've heard that's a good one, the red clover for like a cover yeah, it's crop. Great. Yeah. Yeah. UVM, uh, Heather Darby did a, a cover crop study and that was, that was one of the best. Um, so, yeah. And we did trials um, up in um, Alberg with our genetics with Heather. Oh, Alberg, up in, up in Emerald Visions country. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, I've been all over the place. <laughs> it's been up. awesome. So, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're in Chittenden County now, but I just, I feel like, I mean, I was driving up to the NEK on the daily from Lamoille and then from here, from Chittenden. So not so, so great on gas, but, yeah, no. you know, it was good to be up there. So hmm. I hope I answered your question. You did. How do you, um, I, I'm curious about like the, maybe some of your, uh, your process of going through and finding packaging for your smokes and things like that. Have you had any issues with that or was that fairly straightforward or what? Um, well, well, <laughs> curiously, when, when, so we use glass test tubes and we use for our, our a hemp infused coconut oil, uh. this guy, a glass, um, we had, we, Rick was like, glass is becoming, um, is going to be at a deficit because of COVID. And so we bought up a ton when we had better, you know, some cash flow. So we have, these are the only two um, things we've used. What um, about for the packs of smokes? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's at the manufacturer, so that's not been a problem. That's okay. all like the, the folks that package this. That all. No, comes. that's just paper, huh? Yeah, it's just paper. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, we haven't, um, I hope to collaborate with, um, someone who's manufacturing, um, who got a cannabis manufacturing license. And so we might do like a branding opportunity, um, with Mary STEM <laughs> instead of Maristem. Uh, and so I, she's awesome. It's Sarah, um, Stillman from Bear Mother Cannabis. Um, she's an herbalist. And Ooh. so I know you asked about our cultivation techniques and no one, I mean, we all know monocultures, you know, biodiversity is where it's at, like yeah. in our world and in our plants, sure. yeah. <laughs> in humans and plants. Um, so we're developing, I'm really excited because we're developing it on a hemp uh, CBD side, these really cool maple focused, um, all local products, botanical edible so maybe within the next i'd say i'm hoping cross your fingers uh three months we should have um an edible both on the hemp side and then with her on the weed side cool yeah yeah but we okay. want to stay solidly with maristone farms mainly because you know like i have an obligation to keep creating reliable consistent well-loved products not me saying it but you know others mm -hmm. so you know, we just didn't have the capital to, to can, do can everything. I, else. Oh, oh, can I tell you the one um, complaint that I've heard about the hemp smokes is that the oil will eventually leak out over time. If you don't, awesome. like, I, I feel like most people with cigarettes, you're going to smoke like a pack very quickly. Oh, um, the hemp smokes, it, it seems so like, if you, yeah, size? if you leave them, if you leave them, the oil does start to leak. Although I, I was still smoking them and it was fine. Uh, although yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one, um, the one singular complaint that I've heard about that product. Yeah, yeah. I think I might know who said that. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because somebody else, I hear you. And I mean, the idea on the smokes are, to your point, like a cigarette um, to, you know, keep them. It's like chain smoking. My, yeah, by yeah. the way, my husband smokes nicotine. Oh, by the way. So, you know, you can, you two can chat about that and the addiction <laughs> and the extreme difficulty. My cigarettes don't drip oil out. The yeah, right. Exactly. But I just want to say to that point, and you know, I'll take criticism all day. Fine. Totally. Uh, that's cool. That's the only one I have. No, I know. I know. I mean, trust me. I've that's gotten a, a whole ton. What? <laughs> that's how you know they're good, right? Rick's like over there like, that's how you know they're good. There's oil. But that is, I just want to say to that person's criticism, due respect, that also is how you know they're good if there's oil. And so a response from someone who makes hash for a long time was like, Oh my God, there's oil. I can see the oil. They're really, really good. I was like, so there you go. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. <laughs> but that's cool. Whatever. Well, that's it. That, <laughs> that's was, okay. that was the best response I've got to any single <laughs> criticism I've levied towards. <laughs> Whatever. Bring it on. I don't care. <laughs> it's all good. Well, can I, Jen? <laughs> it's all good. How do you how do you select genetics that are, are well suited to oh. survive the Vermont climate? Oh God, um, you know, first of all, we've been working with the same six for a while. Um, you know, it's, God, there's so much volatility in farming. I mean, there just is. And, you know, this past year we did a really tiny trial mainly because we had enough product and I never want to have, I don't know, whatever. We've never had too much hemp, which is I'm amazed that I can say that, right? Like I'm not sitting on super sacks full of hemp. Thank God. Um, there was moments where we thought we were going oh, to be. Boy. So, you know, like I, I feel for all those farmers, honestly, I don't ever look at any farmer who has made a choice and took a risk because I mean, you know, it's hindsight is really 2020. It's, it's, it's super hard to predict the market. Certainly there are wise choices and not, um, but uh, wait, I totally lost my train of thought. What was the question again? What was the question? Are you having a stoner moment? I'm having a stoner moment. I don't yeah, even remember the question. You I are. <laughs> Can we record what you just asked me? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, well, move on. <laughs> Hell yeah.
<laughs> I got a couple more. Look, we only have 15 minutes left, so it's good that you, right. you fizzled out. We'll go back. I'll ask it as a follow-up. You can follow soften up. the edge if we're in, in the middle, but I just, yeah. I'll go, anyway. I'll go ask it as a follow-up on, on the next interview. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, <laughs> I, I feel like the first time we spoke, we talked about the uh, business development fund or something about a social equity fund. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, there's a business development fund. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you care to speak on that at all? Um, it's too small. <laughs> it's 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 too small. Um, everybody knows that. Um, and it needs to grow. I mean, I think if I'm correct, New York came out with, um, you know, they have million dollar loans they're able to give out. Now, of course, New York state is a much larger, um, richer, arguably state, um, and Vermont needs to do it its own way, but yeah, it's, it's too small. Um, and that's that would be my response. And also, like, who's deciding how that money will be dispersed? Those deciders need to look like those that were harmed in the war on drugs, not people who are reluctantly, you know, part of the deciding, right? Like, don't really want cannabis, are on the fence, maybe aren't educated enough on cannabis. Um, and, you know, are making decisions that will impact that could potentially be a wonderful like incubator for the industry and an economy there's 153 organic dairy farms left in vermont like like what we we definitely need industry and we need that industry to thrive and it can't be in the hands of few Mm. you know boy it did seem like that ben and jerry sale off the unilever did not help Seemed like that put a lot of small family farms out of business. It seems like maybe up in St. Albans, we're seeing some of the same activity of the consolidation of these industries into a larger like industrial, you know, factory farming model, which yeah. does seem to be hurting a lot of the small uh, family farms that have been here for many generations. Yeah. Yeah. And, sure. I, and I worry about that same thing in the cannabis industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it does seem from, you know, what I listened to is that there's a lot of momentum to keep it cottage, artisanal, small. Um, and I, I, I mean, you, you, and I mean, I don't think I've, yes, of course there are some large players and you know way more about this than I do right now. So, um, I think, so. <laughs> you know, we just need to, I, I mean, look, running a business is, is not easy. No, I, I, you know, anyone who says it is, is definitely lying. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's why we, it's why we look to partner, to, to, to do a farm partner. Like it's, it means that Maristone Farms isn't just impacting what we do, right? On like on gain and any kind of gain, we are also impacting someone who's trying to survive as a farm. And so, and so we're sort of trying to fuel an economy, right? Where are we buying? We're buying local. We're buying at White River Grow Pro and Menards Yay. and still trying yeah. to get them on the show. Stephanie. Stephanie. She's awesome. I love Stephanie. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Like she's talking me through some things and no, you know, so buying locally, looking where I can collaborate locally, you know, with a local herbal, I mean, obviously an herbalist, of course, if I'm doing a weed product, it's it's local. Um, And, uh, you know, just, just trying to like take steps that raise up others that can come along with together with with us um and pushing back where you look at the regulations and they're they don't sound right i mean that's you know what rick's got a keener eye on that on policy um and my voice i try to lend as much as possible um, when it comes to looking like at you know a systemic and systemic racist policies that our country's been pushing out. Um, so I've been looking and learning right now in the social equity caucus, if I could just add this With part. Susanna There's Davis? Susanna, yeah, Davis. Susanna, yeah, and I wasn't other- sure how to say her name. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, she has this good pronunciation. Uh, I think I love this because it's like kind of naming like you don't know how to pronounce my name. Go on the site and there's a little, you know, click and it pronounces it. Oh, for yeah, you, yeah. So. yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, right now the Social Equity Caucus is working, has developed um, these probing equity questions which is a way to normalize um, the use of equity, like the, the, the use of a lens that um, looks at all bills through an equity lens. Um, and then there's just these questions that you that you ask. And I know for certain, because I asked Julie, um, the Cannabis Control Board is using them is using them. Like, for example, who will this bill impact? You know, who have you engaged? right? Like which individuals, um, how have you engaged them? And they're using it on the new sets of rules. So I was really happy to hear that. Like she said, oh yeah, there's, it's part of our, our process. Um, so, you know, no, nothing's perfect, but it's certainly awareness is key, right? And let me so pose this to you. Uh, this is a great question someone threw at me. He said, what about social equity for those people that don't want to get involved in this industry that has maybe negatively impacted their life? And I believe he said, not every black person wants to sell weed. Um, any thoughts on that sentiment? Well, that to be sure. Um, wait, so the question is social. So it was like about social equity. It was about social equity for people who do not like people who are negatively impacted by the war on drugs who don't want to get involved in this industry. Yes. Which I thought was yes. a really great question. Yes. I can. And I think I do too. And it's also why I spend a lot of time in spaces like the social equity caucus, because I do not believe that we can pat ourselves on the back just because we have social equity candidates. That is not going to solve anything. I mean, it, it, and also it's, it's, takes a lot to start a business anybody anybody and yes white folks have that privilege right. getting have, back to the capital stuff we were talking about earlier yeah and who you're connected with and the lack of intergenerational wealth because of policies that are discriminatory from so long ago right you know like gi bills etc that meant something you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let them know jen yeah. <laughs> so that's a brilliant question. And I think super important. And it also expands our lens, right? Systemic racism is everywhere. And we cannot argue that the CCB is going to solve all the problems of racism. And I don't want to put that all on them either. Oh, this there's the, yeah, there's no way they could. Yes. Should it be more representational? Yes, of course. Uh, yes, of course. They're aware of that. Right. And ask them why. You know, why isn't it more represent representative? Was there no candidate that was black? Right. Was there no like, did you ask? Well, did there you were. They, they did it? interview some. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. So so but but it doesn't mean I'm going to damn them. I'm no, just no, going to. It's not their it. fault. I don't blame Julie for right. hiring Julie. She didn't right. hire herself. You know, That's exactly I maybe, right. I thought maybe a little representation, at least on the advisory committee. Right. The only brown yeah. guy we saw was a cop. Right. And, and I don't think that's my idea of diversity in a market that's negatively impacted people that were affected like, with the war on drugs, you know, right. like right. That, and, wasn't, and that wasn't what I had in mind. Exactly. And so let's correct that. The, the, the problem would be is if you know, if you acknowledge a problem and then you don't do anything about it. Hmm. Right. And so now they know they should. Right. I, I know that their staff is more diverse. I need I think they need to communicate that. Um, but I'm not looking at the CCB to solve the you know systemic racism, no. and <laughs> white supremacy. In our country. Like, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's just, yeah. They don't have that much power. So, you know, it's why I look more broadly and I'm part of the social equity caucus and I'm having conversations with my local town legislators that is going to Montpelier and raising bills you know she, i just had a coffee with her on monday and we sat down and looked at probing equity questions like do you Ooh. understand them how are you gonna and she's on like you know she she's interested in education and she's looking at bills and you know she's now going to take that and engage differently right she awesome. thinks she has a solution she is white, um, but, you know, white from, you know, with a, a anyway, white is such well, a blanket statement. Well, no, <laughs> but in Vermont, most of the people that were negatively impacted by drugs, if you're just looking at the pure numbers, are going to be white people. Right. Just by the statistics. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Which is another nuance to Vermont that I think needs to be respected, right? Like, not. I, I, it's also why you even though black that. people are still being disproportionately pulled over in Vermont, which I've sure. seen those numbers too. But and if I, you're just looking at the pure numbers of people, like it's overwhelmingly white just by the pure statistics. Right. And so if you're looking at programs that raise up to your friend's point, right, about, you know, equity, if you're looking at programs that help those that have been dis you know, harmed or disadvantaged, you're ultimately going to be touching not only, you know, someone who is black, but also somebody who has been harmed. So, you know, it's like, I mean, the, the most mundane, not mundane, but example that I use when people who are white say, well, like, why should I care? It's sort of like, it's, you remember ADA, right? The, the, um, Americans with Disabilities Act. Disability Act. Thank you. So do you, you know, I know that when I'm carrying packages or, you know, I'm having trouble getting into a building, I use the opener and the door opens. Why is that there? It's not for me, but I'm benefiting, right? Like, so it's like those tiny little tweaks in our system that I we believe, all- I, I believe it's a rising tide raises all boats yeah, or something it's, like that. It sounds sort of cheesy, but it's totally true, right? It and is true, yeah. yeah. I wish that that was always the case in business. Um, I think the the challenge in the cannabis industry is because it's been- in that illegality area for so long, it, you know, it jades, it's, it, it's like makes people feel a little jaded, sure. certainly territorial, um, a little greedy, but in an understandable way, because it's like, I've worked so hard, I've been harmed and I just wanted to try to keep what I have built right. up and here's new people, which is what well, I felt like coming in to I take that. I think the cooperation is gonna be necessary, especially in a state this small. If we're Maybe. supposed to keep out the big corporate money, people got to work together, right? 100%. I mean, we, I, we've done our most exciting work when, um, you know, we get great feedback from a retailer. You know, when I've built relationships and they're happy, I'm happy, they keep buying. Um, you know, I mean, that goes a long way. Just appreciation back and forth. You know, mm. we loved who we were farming with in the Northeast Kingdom. The only reason why we're not is that he just decided to do other things. Mm. Um, and it's pretty far, but mainly because he decided to do other things. So, you know. Jan, we got two minutes here. Um, I <laughs> I know you said a hard stop, so I want to thank you for your time. This has been fantastic. I'm glad we finally got to do this. Yeah, me too. Fun. Um, but if you if you've got any la like last minute shameless plugs or maybe where we can find your product or retailers you're working with or anything we missed, um, this is all you right now. Thank you again, Jen Daniels, Maristem Farms. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So products are all over Vermont. Um, shout out to like Northern Lights and Burn Gallery and oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get slapped because I'm not gonna say everybody the Hempicurian oh my god uh Garcia's uh, uh let's see oh Clover PJ um and there's others it's on our website I love you all <laughs> what oh elevated stage and still <laughs> Kelsey Rapp. yeah yeah <laughs> all right green green leaves you know Joey um, yeah. there, there are lots of places. Hopefully, coming soon to you in DC. God, please say a prayer on that one. Um, but I just want to say, like, we need to like decentralize our idea of where solutions and decisions come from, right? Like, I I, I think we've learned to not rely always on bureaucracies and try to create like other systems and other ways of you know making solutions. So and 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 being really creative. I mean, that's I think why we're still here. <laughs> So anyway, for now. yeah, for now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm here. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Thank yeah, you. so it's been, much, Caleb. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. I, I really, I, I wish you the best of luck and I hope we can catch up a little bit down the road and see how you're doing. Yeah, reach out. Absolutely. I appreciate the time. Really. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And tell Rick to hit me up. Rick? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yo, I, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, no, right down. Reach out for sure. Yeah. Take care. All right. I got to go. Bye-bye.